Hello and welcome to the Atlas Agency, a channel all about Arkham Horror, the card game. I'm your host Brandon, and I'm back today to share my thoughts on the scenario content in Mythos Pack number 3 of the Forgotten Age cycle, Heart of the Elders. This is a scenario which sees the investigators returning back to where the Forgotten Age cycle first began, in the dangerous, untamed wilds of Mexico. Heart of the Elders does something new we haven't seen before in a Mythos pack. It's our first pack to have a two-part scenario. What that means is that this expansion actually contains two different scenarios, Heart of the Elders Part A and Heart of the Elders Part B. Each of these parts is somewhat smaller than a typical scenario, but they're nonetheless two distinct scenario experiences. Each of the two parts has its own act and agenda decks, and the two parts use two different sets of locations and two different encounter decks. Among the new encounter cards in the pack, there are a few that are used in both parts, some that are only used in Part A, and then some that are only used in Part B. The two parts do share one Chaos Token reference card, so you do have the same token effects in both scenarios, though some differences in circumstances in Part B change the impact of at least one of those effects. You'll play through Heart of the Elders Part A, and then once it's completed, you'll proceed on to Part B. There's a rule that you're not permitted to spend experience to change your deck between Part A and Part B. You do earn experience in Part A, you just have to wait until after you finish Part B to spend it. Aside from that, though, it's essentially two separate scenarios that happen to share a token reference card, and that happen to come in the same pack. So that should give you the basic idea of how this setup works. If you're thinking to yourself that getting two scenarios for the price of one sounds a little too good to be true, then you've got good instincts. I think there's definitely a trade-off taking place here, and to me, neither of these scenarios is as robust, as unique, or as interesting as a typical Arkham scenario. That's partly due to the limits of the card count, Fitting two scenarios into the space, usually allotted to one, means each of these scenarios has fewer unique cards at its disposal. There's just less material to flesh out each scenario. For example, I mentioned there are different act and agenda decks for each scenario. To do that, those all end up having to be pretty small. So the scenarios start out at a natural disadvantage there. Part of it is also that these particular scenario designs borrow heavily from earlier scenarios in the Forgotten Age campaign. In fact, they really feel like direct echoes of the deluxe box experience. We see sort of the same themes, the same game play patterns, the same clusters of encounter sets being combined together, and also some reused locations. All that comes together to deliver a strong sense of deja vu here, especially in Part A. There are differences in new things, obviously, but for me it wasn't quite enough to really set these scenarios apart. This has been kind of a recurring theme for the cycle, as I'd previously dinged the deluxe box for the fact that its two scenarios felt very similar to each other. Now here we have two more scenarios with very similar patterns. Another thing I wanted to mention is that there's some structural awkwardness happening in Part A of Heart of the Elders. Uh, this gets a little further into specifics than I usually go, so if you haven't played and you want to avoid some minor spoilers, go ahead and skip ahead a bit until you see the image change. But one of the features that really defines Part A is the fact that the scenario can be repeated. In fact, it has to be repeated until you reach the goal. If you resign or fall short of the goal, you just try again. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that, but in this particular situation, it interacts awkwardly with some of the other things that are going on. For example, one of the effects from the previous interlude might tell you you're not allowed to mulligan your opening hand in this scenario, which is sort of pointless because if you don't like your hand, by the rules as written, you can still effectively mulligan by resigning and restarting the whole scenario. Or another setup effect puts a location into play, picked at random from a small set of possibilities, some of which give me more trouble than others. Others. Rules as written, I can just resign until I get dealt the location I like. That's not all the weird loopholes this creates, but you get the idea. A lot of people will just choose not to do those things and play the hands they're dealt, which is fine. Honestly, that's how I usually roll, but these definitely seem like glitches and avoidable ones at that. I have to wonder if some of these were intentional because they're so obvious in play, I can't imagine they went unnoticed in playtesting. So because of all that, Part A has a weird vibe at times. Let's talk about a couple of things I did like about these scenarios. First, I liked some of the new encounter cards that appear here. Poisonous Spores is one I found really interesting. It's reminiscent of a previous card from one of my favorite scenarios, the Pallid Mask. I like the fact that as the other treacheries in the deck change between Part A and Part B, you run into some different interactions between Poisonous Spores and the other cards. It gets different cards to combo off of. Apex Strangleweed is another cool card. I think I may like that one largely because of its theme. I think Killer Plants are a great pulp adventure trope, and it's nice to get something that's not a serpent person. 
I think some of the abilities in Part A that are designed to interact with and mitigate vengeance, like Time Racked Woods, are cool. Unfortunately, though, in practice, I think they're undercut a little too much by the structural loophole I mentioned earlier. Finally, Part B features what I think is a nice twist on the Explore mechanic. It's a small change, but it works, and I'm happy we didn't just get Vanilla Explore yet again. I actually wish this tweak had been used earlier back in Scenario 2 of the Deluxe Box, just to add some variety between its two Explore scenarios. It's a simple enough variant that I think it would have fit fine there, but better late than never. Overall, I rate the scenario content in Heart of the Elders slightly below average. I don't think either scenario is unpleasant to play. In fact, I'd say I had more fun playing these than I did playing the previous scenario, The Boundary Beyond, even though Boundary Beyond is without a doubt a much more unique experience. But I doubt either part of Heart of the Elders is going to wind up claiming a spot on anyone's list of favorite scenarios, simply because they just don't do enough to stand out. That's all for this look at Heart of the Elders. I hope you've enjoyed hearing my thoughts. Before I go, I wanted to acknowledge that I have fallen a bit behind in covering this cycle. I'm going to do my best to get caught up, but that may take me a little while. More than likely, when the Circle Undone lands, I'll prioritize staying current on that and fill in the remainder of the Forgotten Age as I have time. Thanks for your patience, and as always, thanks for watching, and good luck in your own investigations into the Forgotten Age. <laughs>